Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> good. I'm, I, oh, good. So now I can see both of us. So I'm assuming when people see this, they can see both of us too now. I don't I really know. So. Yeah. All right, cool. So everybody, this is Dr. Amanda Kemp, and I'm here with my friend. And um, what should we call you? I was a co-liberator, uh, co-planter, tiller of the soil. What do you feel like your, your title should be today, Lisa? Ooh, today, co-mixing it up. <laughs> co-mixing it up. Yeah. Queen. I'll take that. So Lisa Grostein, I didn't say her name yet. Yeah, I'm Lisa Grostein. <laughs> Yay. So and we're here to talk about, we're going to have an occasional uh, series of, con- okay, occasional conversation. We're calling it an occasional series about mm-hmm. things that are really important and timely to us. Yeah. <laughs> and we think are important timely to you as those of us who are all looking at racial, working towards cultivating racial justice from the heart. So I asked Lisa if she would have a conversation with me and it really is an exploration. Mm-hmm. So we, where we come to by the end of our time together might not be where we start at. Yeah. So I'm just giving us uh, permission to yeah. hold what we're holding with open hands and see kind of where we come up. Um, But our topic today is specifically white women's tears. And I asked Lisa if she would have a conversation with me about this because um, I've had a number of white women um, who are working in racial justice organizations or in efforts who are, uh, not expressing themselves Mm -hmm. because they're afraid they'll cry Mm -hmm. and that that will then lead to the oppression or the reinforcement of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So I have a different opinion about that. Um, And I also know that white women's tears have been used to, um, to really maintain white supremacy. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, but, so let me just open up for you, Lisa. I mean, so you can start with, if you want to start on a personal level with yourself, your tears as a white woman, or if you want to start on a more group level, what you've noticed about white women in tears. Yeah. Um, thanks. So definitely, right, there was a time in the 90s where there wasn't talk about that, but that often at diversity workshops, spaces where race was getting talked about in multiracial spaces, Um, we as white women would have some kind of aha moment or realization. Um, And at least for me, that was often about my own complicity and guilt in the system. Um, Or just like facing a reality that folks of color have to live with all the time that we had sort of been in denial about and could kind of push away. And so like actually feeling it um, and crying and where I think that pattern was really like, cool, now all the emotional energy of the group is around caring for us and either, you know, doing tone policing for the folks who brought up this stuff, making sure we're okay. I think particularly for those of us who were committed to doing racial justice work, um, because I was maybe like half a step further than some other white folks, there was also a way I could, I could see people of color like wanting me to stay in, so wanting to make sure I was comfortable, so I stayed in and didn't leave, because right, if we're not comfortable, we as white folks check out often. Um, and I think what shifted is like that dynamic has actually gotten named. So when people say like white women tears, I think about that space, as well as like the bigger historical piece of, Um, really at any point in the history of this country, if I as a white woman scream or cry and point particularly at a black man, right, I can make sure he gets arrested if not beaten, if not lynched or killed. And so like the historical legacy of white women's tears on top of like the current dynamic in progressive racial justice spaces. Um, And I feel like the dynamic that part of that naming has shifted is that now there's this like, well, as a white woman, I shouldn't cry. Like I got to hold those emotions in. And I think of it sort of like a pendulum swinging. Like we haven't gotten to the point of health, right? Like when my crying is about my taking up emotional space in the group, about asking the group to do emotional caretaking for me, that's messed up. When my complete emotional withdrawal and reserve is about not wanting to look like that white woman, that's messed up because I'm not being authentic or real. And so I think about the times when I can be present and when my emotional expression, whether it's tears or something else, is about being with people and is about 
affirming the experiences that are being shared about actually being vulnerable with the group versus looking like I'm vulnerable and asking the group to take care of me, but actually being vulnerable. Um, and so like where we need to tease out that dynamic and be clear what it is we're about when we say no white women's tears or when we talk about those tears. Um, yeah. Phrase particularly useful now because of all the ways it sort of means different things. Yeah. And I think one of the benefits you mentioned, you talked about the nineties. So I think it is an advancement to yeah. identify the pattern, as you said, you know, so that people can, um, take a step back from their automatic reactions, yeah. right? Let's yeah. jump in and persuade or comfort so-and-so so that, you know, she feels safe or good. And, you know, <laughs> let's forget about what was raised over here. Right, right. right. What actually I mean, it's, to. <laughs> it's so amazing when you say it. It's so amazing that, that we went along with it or that, that we went along with it in, quote, diversity workshops. The spaces where you're supposed to be actually waking up to seeing things, you know, that, um, that in some way that we, what's that word called, colluded with it to some extent, you know? Um, or I, I guess maybe my experience was maybe seeing more polarization. Mm -hmm. At that moment, then you would have more, more likely white people identifying with the white woman in tears and seeing, trying to protect her. Mm -hmm. And then more people of color feeling like deserted or, you know, scared or angry, all of that. Right. And then you'd have a few people of color who'd be like, <gasps> very protective of the white woman. <laughs> You know, like that whole, the, the mammy figure, you know what I'm saying? Really like, oh, you upset her, but the rest of us are going to get it, you know? So we do have these historic patterns as people of color of how we dealt with those white women tears too. Hmm. Right. And like that's, that, that to me is the whole story of feminism in this country is like, let's just keep centering white women and what our needs are at the exclusion mm -hmm. of women of color, gender queer people of color. And so like, I'm not surprised the dynamic showed up in diversity workshops, right? Because I think like we just, we only know how to act the way we know how to act. And like when I think about what, what were the moments that for me shifted those dynamics, like it wasn't one, it was a series of spaces. And in each one of those spaces, it was because I was surrounded by other people who were intentionally invested in how do we do something different yeah. that is helpful. Yeah. You know, so I think about a time, I think actually you and I were probably at the same workshop. Um, and uh, a friend of ours who's a black man was relating a story of when the cops, you know, um, attacked and pulled a gun on him and he's, he was right next to me on the sofa and he was really upset um, understandably while he's telling this story and I was like okay I'm not supposed to cry I don't know what I'm supposed to do it's about right you know I just remember like while I'm listening to him and trying to be with him in the story I'm also running this narrative of like well don't do the wrong thing but the, and so what it looked like to everybody else was that I was completely frozen right and part of that comes from like how I grew up and where like my family did not deal with big emotions and stuff and all that and, and I got feedback from people afterwards about being frozen in that moment. I was like, well, I don't want to be the frozen white person when my friend is telling this story, you know? And so like, I had to really look at that moment about like the continual learning I have to do around all these systems is, is not about me in that moment. It's not about me at all. And if I had been asking, what does my friend need versus I don't want to be the white woman who does or how I'm supposed to show up in this moment, I could have figured out ways to be much more present to him yeah. and in that moment and since that time that's the question I really sat with is like what do I hear the the expressed or unexpressed need of the person who's sharing because yeah. when I can respond to that that's authentic and it's focused on that person and it's not about me at all so it just completely interrupts that dynamic of like my emotional caretaking yeah. and so I think of times when friends of color of mine have been sharing intense stories and sometimes I've cried because that's the emotion it evokes in me but because I'm crying because I'm hearing them and I'm listening to them with my heart and I'm not pulling my own narrative and my and centering my own character in it. I think it mostly comes across as like, I'm with you. I hear you. I like, I care about you enough. I'm going to cry over this too. Yes. Um, and I get a very different response, which is why I think that is actually what's happening, you know? Right. Um, 
but it's complicated and it's complicated when you're in a group where you don't know folks and you don't have relationships and trust and now that we've kind of got all this language like it would be great if we could say like no centering white women's emotional needs over people of color's emotional needs when talking about racism because that's what we're talking about <laughs> right but that's not as catchy as like no tears oh but let's slow that down yeah as my son would say let's roll that back <laughs> no <laughs> okay no centering white women's needs when we are talking about racism, people of color and racism. Is that what you said? I think it was maybe even over people of color's emotional needs when we're talking about racism. Right? Uh -huh. Which can't be present. Over. Right. It's over the over people it's of the color's over. emotional needs right. when we're talking about racism. Right. Yeah. Right, because I need to be over. fully present if that's going to be a real conversation and if I'm going to yeah. really show up. But when it's my emotional needs over somebody else's emotional needs, then it's just replicating that whole system we're trying to interrupt and dismantle. Right. You know, when you said, uh, it's like what you show up for, mm -hmm. you know, so are you showing up in a, in a group or a learning opportunity? Um, are you, sh you know, showing up for your own learning, for your growth, for your expansion? Are you showing up to be supportive to somebody's asked you to show up for something, you know, and it's, you know, they're on the floor, or they're leading the way. I think that does affect, right, yeah. what you, yeah. what expectation you have. Well, and I can think of times too when I've been facilitating workshops um, and like I think of two cases in particular where a black woman has been sharing a really intense painful story and doing a lot of her own work with the group holding that space. Yes. Because of, of these two times I'm thinking of, of who those women have told us who they are, of what mm -hmm. they have to do, of where they are wanting to be in relationship with other women of color, other black women, white women, like sometimes I have gone up and like been in physical contact as a way of supporting that process. And other times I have really, really kept my distance. Like I've been fully engaged, but it's because I'm paying attention to what they have told me they are there to do, what they have told me they want. And what I also am like, particularly in that facilitator way, like listening at a head level and listening at a heart level, listening at a physical level for like, what's the invitation for engagement here? Mm. And then when I am really tuned into that, I feel like I can be really present for people at the right level of engagement of whatever that, that looks like. Again, because it's about them, mm. not about me. Yes. Right. And so like one time, even the, the invitation was really clear for me to like physically engage with this woman, um, there are other people engaging with her too to be in this process. And afterwards, several participants of more than one race said, I wouldn't have expected you as a white woman to step into that, right? Mm -hmm. Because of all the preconceptions we have about where that becomes dangerous of how I'm going to overstep, of replicating different patterns. Um, and I checked in with the person afterwards to make sure that like what I had been intuiting mm -hmm. was actually real. Yeah. <laughs> for them, but I wasn't off. Um, and it, and it wasn't. And so then it's really about like, how do we show up for each other? And so I know there's also all this conversation about, are you an ally? Are you an accomplice? Like, where do we, we stand? And to me, the truest thing, both for racial justice work and for my Quaker faith is like, my job is to be present to other people. Mm -hmm. right? My job is to witness um, at the most engaged level I can with other people. And that that's how we dismantle oppression and build the beloved community is that we be so utterly present with each other. Um, and that's also the spaces where I find we can cut through a lot of these internalized patterns. Mm -hmm. All right. What is our friend Neo Nu say? She says the first diversity issue is separation. Yes. Right? And being present is the opposite of separation. It's saying yes. like, I'm going to, I am going to move all of my energy and attention to the thing that is happening for you. This moment, yes. That is with you, in support of you, open yeah. to you, and is not about my stuff in that moment. Right. And right. I, I wanna come back to that because you do have stuff and you do have needs and you do need spaces where you can be centered. Yeah. 
Right. And I, and that's like another time when I think about like where I have cried a lot as a white woman in a diversity workshop space was at a beyond diversity 101 workshop. I don't remember if it was one of the ones you were at or not as a participant. And I don't remember what we were talking about, but something earlier in the day had triggered for me um, just like realizing how disconnected from my ancestors I was that because my white ancestors and I have, I have Persian ancestors too, but all my ancestors who came here intentionally gave up their ethnicity to get to buy into white privilege and white supremacy and white power here. Um, and like, I had sort of internalized that I wasn't supposed to feel grief over that because we got the privilege, right? We came out on top socially, but I got in touch like for the first time at a deep level, the grief I had over my disconnection with my ancestors and the loss of culture and heritage and like lineage. And so I'm sitting in this room and it's like a conversation about something else. And, and, um, our friend Kevin, who's a healer, like he picked up on what was going on. He came over to me, put his hand on my back. He said, just breathe and cry. And that mm -hmm. permission giving, I just started like sobbing. I mean, that kind of sobbing mm -hmm. where like, you can hear you three rooms away, like there's fluids coming out of every or like everything's just going. And what was great was because the people in that space were there for all of us to do healing work, everyone just kept going on with the conversation. Like they saw that Kevin was giving me some care. So I wasn't like falling out of my chair by myself. And what I was doing wasn't what the group needed to be doing. So the group kept moving. And I think about that as a way where I got some like deep emotional needs and work met and started in a public space without sidetracking the group. Yeah. And I also felt okay doing that because I trusted the facilitators in the group to know like I was having some kind of a moment that didn't need the group's attention and care in that way in that moment. Yes. Um, and so I also think about like, how else does that show up? When do I say, actually, I have an emotional need. Is there someone who can help me meet it? Right. And how different that is than like in a group or like, oh, you hurt my feelings or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Maybe you did hurt my feelings, but what if I said, hey, you hurt my feelings. Can we talk about it? It's so different than like all the ways we as white women have been taught to shut down women of color or other folks of color who are disrupting some lie we've had going that is part of our, our being. Yeah. Right? Mm. Mm. yeah I just want to be with what you just said um, how you got in touch with your own grief and you had a ton of tears yeah. and um, you let yourself feel them yeah. and there was one person who was supporting you who as we both know is black but who chose to support you right. as you were going through that. Right. And the multiracial group kept going with whatever it was that, you know, was the focus at that moment for the group. So it just sounds like, it, it sounds like a lot of key people being in touch yeah. with themselves and, you know. Yeah. Well, and, and Kevin, who was and, supporting was also there in a facilitator supportive role capacity. Right. I think His, it was easier for me to accept. I was like, oh, you have, you have signed up to support he us. He signed up to do that. And then yeah. he came over to do, yeah. fulfill him what he, his intention was. Yeah. And you knew that. And so you let him. Yes. Yeah. And the group knew that. So they let him do it. And they kept doing, and the facilitators, right. tours, so we don't know. I don't remember the occasion either. But when you said it, I saw it visually, so I'm not sure if I was there or if you just created it <laughs> so well. But all those folks didn't let themselves be sidetracked. And, you know, one of the things, um, it's, uh, here's, let me just say this. I've heard, uh, I think her name is Catrice. Oh, I'm forgetting Catrice's last name. It might be Johnson. But she, she has that book about the Becky Code, cracking the Becky Code. Um, and um, one of the things she talks about is compassionate detachment. Mm -hmm. It's like a way to be with somebody without being manipulated yeah. by their feelings. So letting someone have their feelings, staying present, but not being like triggered into what do I do to make this person feel something different, you know? Um, and I, I think that's another level of presence. Yes. Right? Yes. 
just to mm -hmm. when we're feeling those feelings like why are we when we're expressing them in a group even if the group's two other people is it because we just want to have them witness is it because we want care or is it because we want problem solving like there's such a range of ways when somebody is upset about something and i know the times when i can be clear like i actually just need you to hear this is really different than i'm like i need you to help me solve this or resolve this um, and then when I can be clear about that, other people can then engage with me much more effectively or say like, I can't help you solve that. That's not, you know, w whatever those boundary settings are. Mm. Um, and that to me is like how I'm present with myself. So I'm inviting other people to be present with me. And I just think about how much we as white folks have been taught and mistakenly believed that the only way we can get our emotional needs met is when people of color do something for us, mm. right? Because that's such the system of how racism functions in this country, or that the only place we can have the real conversations about race are if people of color are present, teaching us, we can then push back, resist, deny, poke at, whatever, and then they need to make us feel good too. Like those patterns are so deep. And like I was just watching a show on Netflix where that's the entire narrative of the whole series. Mm. Um, and how the characters are set up. And it's not, it's not a, that's not what the show is about, but that's what it's about. Right, right. Um, and just the yeah. way we are, are taught to expect that. So I also think that's part of the white tears thing in, particularly in, in racial justice diversity settings. It's like, well, I am supposed to show up and get something from this. If I don't get what I think it is, let me do something to manipulate other people to give it to me. Right. right. It's all affirmation or caregiving. Yeah. I think it goes back to our guilt, which I think underneath is about our, our grief that we don't process and talk about and name and deal with. Yeah. Well, I want to, I want to name something. And to me, it has to do with um, how, you know, the dominant white normative culture. Is very separated from emotion or somehow there's something shameful about them or unprofessional about emotions, you know. Um, they're not leadership qualities. If you have emotions, you know, that, that whole thing. Um, so really knowing, like having a practice, developing a capacity to be with our feelings, to feel feelings is, um, is important part of your racial justice work. You know what I mean? <laughs> because if you can bring a, a presence and a, and a self and ability to care for yourself to the table, then you are, um, you're less likely to try to manipulate to get what you need. And that's what I appreciate, Amanda, so much about, I mean, there's so much I appreciate about your work, but what feels like one of the really strong through threads is how much attention you put to, to giving space for people to feel, giving us practices for how we can feel, and for not just like feeling, but like the full embodied feeling, like fully, fully feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things I really admire about your writing and workshops and work is I don't experience a line between you as facilitator and person who feels that you, you share that vulnerability, you share that process, you are in that vibe so strongly. Um, and I know from talking to lots of people who have read your book or your blog or gone to your workshops, like that's the thing people come back to. Like they'll start with, oh, it's this great workshop. We did all this stuff. And then they kind of like drop down into like, mm -hmm. like where it's clear there's like gotten permission in ways they haven't experienced before to feel or have gotten tools and ways to feel that allow feelings to grow and move versus just kind of stay stuck and static. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's such a needed, a needed um, core belief and way of being in this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I, I, and I, I really started to understand this when we were at Neonu's training last week. Mm-hmm. Neonu Span did a training last week at the, uh, well, CEO Deeper Change Forum. And one of the things she talked about was um, that her work is about helping the transformer, the agent of transformation, the agent of change, the change maker, um, be mindful, you know, about how we're using our instrument. And our instrument is multi, I don't know, multidimensional? Yeah. What I, (laughs) but what I really mean, and I do believe that, but what I, (laughs) But what I really, in this setting, what I mean is that the instrument is feelings, body, spirit, mind, you know? So if you think that, uh, that you only need the mind, that the mind is the only part of the instrument that you need to bring to bear in this movement to transform our society or our families or our relationships, then you are replicating the system the master's house you know you're just you're 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 you're, you're just cutting off so much more that you could use and um i wonder so i wonder as a white woman um who 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 cries how to use, you know, her instrument mindfully or, you know, I guess, I mean, I know we're exploring that right now. So I wonder what else would you say about using your instrument or how you see other European American women use their instrument? Yeah. I think, I think another piece for me is when I'm in those spaces and other white folks, irrespective of gender, but they're most likely women or genderqueer folks do cry like like one of the old patterns I notice is well let me separate myself from them so I'm the like I'm I'm the cool white person and go hang out with folks of color and not do those patterns and so just like always stepping in with those people and where I can also interrupt like what's the when the tears are about that kind of emotional manipulation of the group or just that that first, like, this is the first time I'm getting that racism is really a thing, like, how I can go and be with people in that space, because there's no replication of the pattern for me to be in that space with them, and to be in that space fully, and so sometimes it's in the group, sometimes that's pulling someone out of the group if they, like, really need to kind of go for it, but then also being in there with them, and so to me, it's not just, like, let me talk to you and listen to you and put my arm around you, but to the extent that the person's comfortable, like let me physically engage with you. Because when we fully feel our emotions, or at least when I do, it's like a full body experience. And sometimes someone just rubbing my back actually feels like distraction versus times when I've been able to like put my hands with somebody or like really embrace somebody or like help them ground their feet on the ground and breathe or just like engage with their body in more than just the kind of what usually feels to me like settle down and calm it down versus like, let me step in there with you. Um, so I think that's a really important piece. And, you know, always asking and getting consent so we're not violating people's boundaries, but not being afraid um, to ask for what we're intuiting is needed mm-hmm. too, and not just assume like, okay, it's just got to be hands and shoulder, you know. Um, and then I think about, you know, what we were talking about earlier, like what are we up to in that space? And so is what I'm bringing into the space, what I'm up to, what other people have said they're up to, what the space we've created together is for. And if it's not, then I think it's about permission asking, you know, like I'm really feeling this now, always a fine thing to say, because feelings are real. And can I get some space for that here and accept a no too, if the answer is no, and then go find that, that need to get met somewhere else. Um, I think about some of the the white women I know who are just like unflappable and can also just sit in the face of whatever conflict or tension is there 
and listen for what's the truth that needs to get spoken. So I think that's a way that I have seen white women use ourselves as tools is like that deep discernment of like what's really happening here and just naming it and naming it from a place of compassion versus like, I'm going to tell you or, you know, call you out, but like, this is what's happening. And I think about how grounding those women have been in my life. Um, and I think it's talking about it. You know, I think it's conversations like this we're exploring stuff. And then I think it's also the work that we as white people need to do among ourselves to both like practice feeling with each other and practice not being cut off at the head. And then also do all of that work. Most of us didn't do growing up of like, let's talk about our racial identity. Let's talk about how we've conditioned. Let's talk about what we're dealing with. Let's talk about how we showed up in this space. Let's talk about how we can show up differently next time. Let's engage with each other. Let's do all of that work. And that still feels like a big skill that a lot, a lot of white folks uh, we need to build mm-hmm. and build and build that muscle, you know, mm-hmm. build that muscle that for survival folks of color have to build at a much earlier age. Mm. Um, one of the things just relating to what you just said about folks of color having to build a muscle at an earlier age think that in the work that I'm starting to do with black women in particular is um, how to shift from being strong to being vulnerable because we've had to be strong right (laughs) which involves at some level involves some degree of separation from our feelings a lot of the times just to get through so there's tears that haven't been shed that need to be shed and um, I guess I'd like to uh, conclude the conversation for now with one last question. And that is, um, what would you say to a European American woman who feels very strongly for racial justice and, you know, wherever she's working, let's say she's a teacher or you know, she works in surge or something else, right? Who, um, who's a crier who just finds herself, you know, she gets up to speak or she raises her hand to speak. What first comes are tears. Mm -hmm. What are some steps for that person? Doesn't be one thing they could do, but maybe you see. I think about, um, what what the tears are about that they need to honor that maybe they're not honoring in their life whether it's emotion or commitment or fear or anxiety or power that they're resisting that they've got whatever whatever it is and i think about right any practice we do that's about honoring something that's true for us that maybe we have been repressing or denying or struggling with that's always a growthful process and a healthy process i think about um like doing some work with some other white women to unpack what the tears are about, right? Because if they're about disempowerment and fear, like how do, we, how do we hold ourselves to get ourselves into an empowered space? And again, it's not a power over, but like a power in and a power with. I think about, um, I, I think a lot of that dynamic is about, well, here's the place where I can talk about racism is in this multiracial space. And where then it means we need to cultivate other spaces in our life so that when we're showing up in multiracial spaces as a white woman, we can show up fully having done our homework and be ready to be present versus like, well, now I get to bring all my stuff because here you are um, and interrupting that pattern and all its subsidiary patterns. Um, and then I think about naming what it is, right? If someone stands up and says, I'm terrified of speaking in public, but this is important, like, all I have for them at that moment is deep compassion. And so then how I'm listening to their tears and their body language, I mostly am just listening from like, like I'm maturing up now. Like I listen from a heart space right. when someone is doing it and it, and it's because like, I want you to take care of me, but that's not what we're here to do. Then I have a lot of resistance to that. Right. And in myself, that means I then need to like, wait till that thing is over and go around and say, all right, I'm going to help you meet your need, but we got to do it in a different way. So that's an invitation for me to interrupt some patterns. But I think it's unpacking, like, what are those tears are about? Like, what, what is it that needs to flow? Yes. 
what is it that needs to flow? And then what's the appropriate space for it to flow? Yes. And when I can identify like, what's my underlying need? And I can say to my community, I have this need. Can someone help me meet it? That's so different than buttonholing a person or hijacking a group to get that need met. Yeah. You know, and maybe I won't get it met, but often I do. Mm-hmm. You know? mm. Yeah. I, and I like how you started by saying you have to honor, honor what the tears are about. Sometimes my experience is that uh, the more I resist, the more I, tears I have because there's something in me that I'm fighting, yeah. you know, and then I'm crying because that thing is not getting hurt or, you know, it's not given any space. Right. And then when you said, you know, finding a space where you could, where you can have that, where you can explore what that's about with other white women. Um, yeah. um, I think that that's, that sounds really lovely. And it can be kind of hard to find other white women who are committed to racial justice and equity, who, <laughs> who are also willing to hold you as you explore that. Yeah. But it's not impossible. It just means that you might have to make yourself vulnerable. Yeah. Well, and I think ask. like anytime someone has said, I've got this real vulnerability and weakness, will you be with me in it? Like one, that feels like an honor. And two, it just makes it that much easier when it needs to be me to say that. Right. Again, that's like one of the functions of the intersection of white supremacy and capitalism is like, if you don't have all your stuff together and aren't super productive and don't have it, like you don't get it versus like, that's not human. That's not how we are, you know? And we're all fighting that all the time. In the yes. Country. And so, um, you know, I was just having a, a talk with a, a white woman yesterday. We weren't talking about racial justice in particular, but just around vulnerability and asking for help. And she was saying, I feel like I, I owe you now because you just gave me all this time on this call. And I said, no, like I'm committed to you. You're part of my community. You asked for help. I could meet a need freely. Like the reciprocity has already happened. Mm. And particularly when we think about like racial justice movement building, it's not just like in the street with the sign or at the hearing. It's all this other work, all this other work we got to do. And white folks, we have not been doing our work for a few centuries. So we got a lot of catching up to do. Yes. Yeah. And I, I like, I just want to maybe end on that note, what you said about uh, when the person said, how do I pay you back? You know, cause you just gave me all this time and you're, and you just said, well, um, what I, what I got from what she said <laughs> was like, you're, you're all part of this. So you giving this to her is, you giving it to yourself, it's her being able to give it to someone else. It's all, yeah. It's another way of looking at it. It's not just a one-on-one -on -one exchange. It's also like feeding the family or the group. Right. And that, which and also that her, feeds you. And that her vulnerability was an invitation for me to be vulnerable. Yes. Right? So vul when we can be vulnerable with each other, that to me always feels like a gift. Yes. I always have more care and love and compassion and space for people who've been vulnerable with me. Mm. And I have more love, compassion, space, gratitude for people I can be vulnerable with. Like it, I think vulnerability is like, that's how we come into the world, right? We're these completely vulnerable babies. And what's the most instantaneous loving relationship I've ever experienced, right? Like I loved my baby before he was born. Mm. You know, and that was all about vulnerability. Like I was deeply vulnerable when I was pregnant. He was deeply vulnerable when he was born. And so the magnitude of love we had was so strong. And so I think there's something there about vulnerability and love too. Mm. That is a piece of that, that, that it, it grows and it grows and it grows. Right. And it, it seems like that when we have our SHIT together, you know, we look so competent and, Again, professional and some of the words I've heard people say. Uh, yeah, articulate. Um, superwoman, strong. like Superwoman. Strong. Yeah, yeah, like that. Um, then 
people don't feel that close to us. They feel further away from us, you know, and then we could feel further away from people because we've got to maintain an image. Right. And, and again, if we're thinking about, well, how do you make change? Ricardo Levis Morales, one of those people who I love and I quote a lot, he says, you got to change the soil. Right. And the soil is the community. It's relationships in the community. He was saying, like, you can't really organize effectively for or against something if you don't have relationships. You know, you can't make your community better without having some level of trust and being able to see each other. And so that work that we do outside of the meetings, these phone calls, is fundamentally about making the soil, aerating the soil, or tending to the soil. A beautiful way to put it yeah says the girl from the bronx <laughs> well i think we're this is a good place to stop for now to pause um let's just take a moment to have a little breath together and, then, and if there's anything that rises for you lisa feel free to share it I think what's coming up for me, Amanda, is just um, deep gratitude for you and for our friendship over the last decade and a half. Um, I was just reflecting on some moments uh, when I have not shown up to be my best self around you and with you and times when we've been able to be really present for each other. And so um, just talking about community and vulnerability and um, just appreciating what time allows for right, that we can show up in different ways and learn from that and come back together and show up in new ways. And that it's not, you know, one and done, but it is, it is being present with each other and learning from each other and growing and that witnessing of that growth and learning together. Um, so I just have, I just have real gratitude for you and for our friendship and for um, the, the work that is laid before us that we get to do right now. Mm. Hmm. Well said. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm gonna thank you. Much love to you. And I'm gonna stop the recording.